uh, with your permission <laughs> uh, i take enormous privilege in welcoming uh, all of you uh, it is a truly a international conference because a uh, lot of faculties including dr suri sir is a international uh, we fame so i am saying that it is a truly a international conference so i am saying that it is going to be i am confident that it is going to be a very high visible scientific session today so um, on on behalf of indian podiatric association and western university college of podiatry medicine california usa so i welcome all the delegates and all the faculty and all my fellow colleagues for this particular fantastic evening uh, thank you very much for giving me opportunity to welcome you all it is a very very great privilege for me and uh, i will formally uh, introduce uh, mr uh, jayshid ahma uh, handal okay he is uh, part of our medical team from okard so he has a uh, 10 years of experience uh, in uh, especially in the th anti infective therapy so i am saying he has a very rich experience and he has lot of publications to do in his shoulders so i am saying that his his experience yeah. i am saying that he is sharing it with uh, many of the occasion uh, because of our one of the nc launch so i happen to uh, listen to his experience especially so i am just uh, welcoming uh, jayshit so over to you you can just uh, welcome and take the meeting forward thank you very much yeah thank you thank you uh, mr vishnu for your warm and uh, uh, on behalf of wocard i welcome all the faculties and all the participants for, uh, who are attending this international webinar and uh, we have uh, esteem welcome dr jayesh yeah thank thank, thank you thank you, thank you very much sir thank you rani sir and uh, uh, on uh, uh, i would formally uh, introduce dr aps suri who is uh, well known he doesn't require any introduction he is a podiatric surgeon and diabetic food specialist and uh, we have uh, the uh, participants from across the world today we have uh, participants from uh, who are attending from uh, 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 attending from the southeast asian countries as well as uh, from india and uh, dr aps suri is a podiatric surgeon uh, surgeon and diabetic food specialist and the president indian podiatry association and he is, he was he was trained uh, at harvard as well as temple university in usa and he is currently working as a chief consultant and director of diabetic food care center new delhi and also is a, a certified hyperbaric oxygen therapy specialist and uh, was experienced a lot of uh, uh, paper to his credit and uh, a lot of research work also he does uh, in the field of uh, diabetic food specialist and especially podiatry and i request dr aps suri uh, to take over the session and uh, present the other faculty that introduce the other faculty sir thank you uh, dr jashet for a nice uh, introduction i think it's a long introduction you told and uh, this is uh, twice in a day we are meeting uh, we just yeah yes sir for <laughs> about one and a half hours before we were having another webinar and uh, nice to see you again uh, jashet thank you so as, as ever so i welcome you all to this webinar and uh, this is a series of webinar under indian podiatry association we have been doing with my co uh, moderator host dr rajini saxena he is the national secretary of indian podiatry association and many other members who are already there in the group uh, dr palvi from uh, bombay dr shalesh he is a president of gujarat chapter from surat dr manish from maharashtra from maharashtra chapter dr dinakan from chennai and many other people from the whole core group we are running about 12 chapters of indian podiatry association and we have started from 2009 and the main motive of our association was to spread education of diabetic foot infections and diabetic foot care in the country because we all know that we don't have any uh, school of podiatry or no college uh, not even in md medicine or ms general surgery or or the uh, the course of podiatry and that's what uh, we have been doing for last 8 to 10 years that we do live workshops in diabetic foot ulcers and diabetic foot care we have been training people and we are proud to say uh, say that we have trained more than 2000 doctors in the country being mbbs level physicians diabetologists general surgeons plastic surgeons and even vascular surgeons and even orthopedic surgeons that shows that all these fields are interested in diabetic foot care and since the 2018 last two years we are also doing a fellowship in diabetic foot management 
and also we are joining with western university of in california with the school of podiatry medicine uh, with dr jonathan labovitz who is one of the speakers he, here and we have been in discussion last since last one year and in, the, in this august 2020 we were supposed to launch a joint fellowship of indian podiatry association and western university college of podiatry medicine in california so con uh, congratulations to dr jonathan and thanks for joining and in near future we will do that and that's something which will spread education of diabetic foot care in the whole country main man behind this motive is uh, mr tj baring who is the advisor and uh, uh, he's uh, uh, he's into this and he has been the main uh, guy uh, sharing his knowledge and coordinating between uh, western university of uh, podiatry medicine and even with uh, uh, indian podiatry association he is ceo and of jeev healthcare in usa ambassador western university of health sciences and he is also advisor to indian podiatry association a very uh, staunch advisor i will say and in fact there's no day that we are not in talk with each other through whatsapp or through messages and he is a staunch advisor to western university of health sciences so welcome uh, mr baring to this webinar and we will have your uh, views into this uh, uh, during the course of the webinar today we have three speakers dr jonathan lebovitz he is from uh, california and he is dpm fac fa fas chc qm and lot of other degrees he have he is a associate dean clinical education and graduate placement and professor of podiatry in the college of podiatric medicine western university of health sciences california usa so welcome dr jonathan lebovitz to this well, uh, webinar and thanks for joining here and spreading your vast education in the field of podiatry which i think a lot of uh, young doctors are here today joined in this group uh, will be get uh, affiliated and have a good take home message from your vast clinical experience and uh, they have been able to listen to you during our workshop last year in 2019th uh, july when you came to india and we had your presentation in delhi and uh, after that workshop also there were a lot of uh, uh feedbacks which came and really uh, all the uh, delegates they appreciated your presentations so uh, congratulations and uh, thanks for joining in and dr uh, jonathan will be speaking on uh, uh, on sharp cuts food which is i think very important topic because this is something as a clinician or as a diabetologist as a physician sometimes we miss it when we have a patient of uh, hot swollen foot and the patient comes and we sometimes thinks that he might be having cellulitis he might be having gout or he might be having some deep vein thrombosis so sometime in this due course of our clinical experience we miss sharp cuts for so dr jonathan will let us know about the clinical implications and his experience in sharp cuts for and after that i'll be taking a session on diabetic foot infection which is the topic for today and there are a lot of guidelines and uh, i uh, will be talking uh, on the uh, more two or three guidelines which are present for diabetic foot infection because every doctor dealing in diabetic foot care sees infection so infection is something which in and out every day we see in most of our patients so this is something of very uh, knowledgeable view that what we can do with infections and what are the latest things in this and the third presentation will be by dr jashit he is from vocard uh, 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 medical sciences and here they have a very good product which is uh, uh, very effective for mrsa and very effective for gram positives and anaerobic infections so this is something which we can use in our clinical practices to hit the bugs because this is a new molecule by the indian company and it's an indian indian product that is very important and most of the trials and most of the research process have been done in usa for this product so dr jashit will let us know about uh, this in the third presentation thank you so much for joining and all the audience uh, we have a chat box you can uh, uh, write down your questions during that or you can just send it by email to me uh, during the course of the presentation and then we can uh, take it uh, take it from there uh, dr uh, uh, dr jonathan you can share your slides yes and uh, Okay, can everybody hear me okay? 
Yes, we can hear you. Okay, I'll go ahead and start. So thank you for having me. I appreciate that. And uh, hopefully I can share this with you and uh, it'll be beneficial. So we'll be talking about the principles to salvaging the uh, Charcot foot. And uh, just some learning objectives here. We're gonna go over the key principles, which is really to appreciate the need for early diagnosis, understand how we stop the active phase and why we have to uh, manage infection to maximize our outcomes. So as I said, the first is really making that early diagnosis. Uh, as, as you go through Charcot foot, it is really a complex uh, etiology. It, the pathophysiology is rather complex uh, and poorly understood. Uh, so diagnosing it becomes much harder when we don't understand the, the background or the basics uh, to it. But one thing we do know is that a difference in between the affected limb and the unaffected limb of about two degrees Celsius, it's highly suggestive of Charcot's foot. And it's actually one of the most reliable symptoms we have. Uh, now that's presuming that it's not a, a, a bilateral pathology. So obviously it's, it's hard to distinguish between limbs of two degrees Celsius when uh, they present bilaterally. Uh, and that does happen, it's not common. But with Charcot foot being poorly understood, one of the main reasons is we don't have that many cases that we know about. It could be that we're underreporting it, uh, but when you don't have many cases, the range, when we look at incidence and prevalence, the range can be rather large. So with bilateral presentation, we're looking anywhere from 5% in some cases to reports up to 30 or 35% of bilateral cases being bilateral. Um, <clears throat> the other symptom that we find, which is rather unique uh, to this, is we neuropathy is a common thread. That's the universal finding uh, in Charcot foot, no matter whether this comes from uh, diabetes, which is the most common cause worldwide, or whether it comes from something like leprosy, uh, which is the most common cause in a lot of underdeveloped nations um, and, and in others around the world. Um, and then there are many, many other uh, etiologies uh, uh, to this, but we know that it's an insensate foot. Yet these patients will often come in with pain. 75% of these patients come in with pain, making this um, confusing to many people because how can you be neuropathic, which you're looking for in this insensate foot, but they, yet they still have pain. So those are things we need to be aware of when trying to make this diagnosis, just as uh, we have to be aware of some other pathology like ulcers. Uh, the ulcer prevalence in patients with uh, Charcot foot varies. The literature is, again, as most cases, like I said in Charcot, the literature is kind of a wide range uh, of what we see in the prevalence of conditions. Um, but the ulcers in the literature are anywhere from 35 to almost 60%. I think we can better understand that when we look at this most recent um, study actually came out of, uh, I think PGI, uh, where the prevalence of ulcers in shark of foot was broken down from acute to chronic. And you can see the progression. Once you have that deformity from Charco in that chronic foot, you're more likely to get um, ulcerations because of abnormal pressure, abnormal shearing forces, abnormal ground reactive forces against the foot. Uh, and you can see it goes from 27% to over, just over 45%. Uh, so ulcers are rather prevalent, uh, further complicating the diagnosis as Dr. Surya just mentioned. The other thing we see uh, are other common uh, pathology seen in the diabetic foot. Um, we see concurrent nephropathy. We see retinopathy from uh, microvascular disease in those two. We also see macrovascular disease. So despite 22% having uh, macrovascular disease and you know, 50, 60% having different microvascular diseases, there was no significant difference in acute and chronic uh, Charcot as to the prevalence of micro or macrovascular disease. So when we talk about Charcot and the delayed diagnosis or a misdiagnosis, um, Chantelau and Schmidt both looked at uh, these, these cases here and, and found you know, almost 80 to 100, nearly 100% of patients can receive a misdiagnosis. Uh, 
they were evaluating patients on an outpatient basis that came to them as a second opinion, basically, or referred to a specialty clinic. Uh, so it's the primary evaluation that's missing uh, these diagnoses. In a study that I did, uh, my team did two years ago, we looked at uh, inpatients uh, who came into the hospital, whether or not they had a, a diagnosis of Charcot, but they were diagnosed and when they were discharged, they did have a diagnosis of Charcot. So we were trying to see the difference if there was a delay in the diagnosis. And we found 13% of patients who were discharged with a diagnosis of Charcot were not admitted with that same diagnosis. So there was a delay in making the diagnosis. And that was looking at a few thousand uh, patients. And what we found was a significant difference in the delayed diagnosis patients coming in with a similar or more common diabetic foot pathology, ulcers, foot infection, or osteomyelitis. All three were significantly greater uh, prevalence when there's a delayed diagnosis, meaning it's likely confusing the, uh, the clinical picture and making it more challenging to make the diagnosis. Uh, the consequence of that is what we're really looking at here and why I say it's a key factor and something we really have to do to salvage this limb is if you look at the prevalence of lower extremity uh, amputations uh, in this population, when there was a delayed diagnosis, there was just over 11% went on to a lower extremity amputation. If it was not delayed and there was a timely diagnosis, it was 8.3%, which was uh, statistically significant. So we can clearly say that this delay has a significant consequence. Uh, it is negatively impacting our patients and resulting in lower extremity amputations. <clears throat> um, a few studies here looked at the delayed treatment and what does that mean? So really stressing the how paramount the early diagnosis is. The sooner we make it, the better. There's greater destruction in the foot. So we know Charcot results in um, uh, breakdown of the foot, remodeling of the, of the bones, and hopefully consolidation in new, um, new architecture of the foot. That, that destruction and loss of architecture causes the uh, gross deformities that we see. We develop those foot ulcers, likely leading to infections in many of them. We know that 50% of foot ulcers in general in the diabetic population uh, are likely to become infected. So obviously this is a pattern that goes on to that normal cascade that we see in any other diabetic of an ulcer leading to an infection and possibly a loss of limb. So what we found is five times, uh, five times they're more likely to have an increased risk of complications in general which includes the lower extremity amputation and mortality, because we know mortality and is the end result of that cascade for many patients uh, from ulcers through an amputation to, to, to death. So an early diagnosis, like I said, is paramount and the delayed treatment can reduce or lose function, quality of life and actually shorten lifespan. Um, so it's critical to salvage a limb and ultimately salvage, potentially salvage someone's life um, making an accurate diagnosis in a timely fashion. Uh, but why are we making these mistakes? You know, Dr. Suri kind of introduced this saying, we make those mistakes. Um, we, we have patients we miss, uh, resulting in delays, uh, resulting in just a complete misdiagnosis. Um, and why that happens, a few studies have looked at that. We, we know that there are assumptions made, as I mentioned, before pain was present in 75% of patients, uh, but how can you have pain in an insensate foot? Um, and that's the main reason that we, we've identified or think we've identified is the diabetic can still preserve some deep pressure sensation, even when there's a loss of protective sensation uh, because of the different uh, nociceptors that, uh, or different receptors that actually uh, can pick up on uh, deep pressure sensation versus protective sensation, uh, vibratory sensation, and so on. Uh, so they can preserve that and still have pain, which is how they would then perceive that. It's an acute inflamed foot, inflamed foot in, the, um, in many cases when it first presents, which can look like an infection. It can look like gout. Uh, it can look like an acute DVT, um, uh, different pain syndromes. Uh, so there are many things that this can uh, mimic. As you saw, we can have concurrent pathology. Many of them come in with an ulcer, like we said, cellulitis and abscess. 
once you have an ulcer, there's no reason they can't also have an abscess. Uh, lack of awareness. It's, it's not poorly understood. Lack of understanding, you know, the pathogenesis. We don't have good diagnostic tests. Again, it all hinges on the pathogenesis. And it's not well understood, so it's not well taught. Uh, so awareness and expertise are also a problem. Uh, and you can see here a differential diagnosis, like we were mentioning these different injuries, septic arthritis as well, different uh, inflammatory arthritis, and a lot of it hinges on clinical suspicion. Uh, cellulitis or infection also, whether or not they have an ulcer. If there's no ulcer, then it's less likely, uh, a lot less likely that this would be just an abscess that formed, uh, but we have to consider that. The next thing we do is we have to stop the active phase. So once we identify this diagnosis and they're in the acute process, we have to make sure that um, we are successful, we get those successful outcomes and offloading is the key. We have to, to interrupt an inflammatory process, we have to eliminate the forces applied to it when there's a mechanical component. When you're walking on your foot and it's inflamed, in this case, we have to interrupt it, we have to remove the weight bearing and all the pressure that goes on to the foot. That increased pressure adds continued trauma and that trauma on an insensate foot that is currently breaking down from an altered osseous metabolism causing uh, osseous uh, uh, breakdown and destruction. Uh, the offloading will remove those forces and try and preserve that. There are two accepted methods of doing this, the total contact cast and now the instant total contact cast. Uh, both of them are irremovable uh, knee-high devices that we use to offload. The typical protocol for a total contact cast is we start as soon as possible. Same with an instant total contact cast for that matter. Um, but this one, or either that's irremovable, we leave on for about three to five days. Now, typically, Sharko will respond very quickly to removing the forces in immobilization so in three to five days, your edema can reduce significantly and the cast will be loose, so you wanna change it. And you can change it even sooner if necessary. You'll change it weekly until the edema stabilizes and then every two to three weeks thereafter until the acute phase is over. The difference with osteomyelitis, the difference with uh, even cellulitis here is the inflammation is independent of the force. And if you put a cast on it thinking it's Charcot, the edema won't resolve, it will not resolve quickly uh, like you do in the Charcot foot. Um, if over 50% of patients can be stabilized with a total contact cast and avoid amputation and even avoid surgery to prevent uh, any bigger problems. I mentioned that these are irremovable knee-high devices and you can use a cam walker or other removable devices. Uh, clearly they're not the two recommended that I mentioned uh, and this is why. So. The, the results or the outcomes that we see with the removable device is about three and a half percent more likely to have uh, our higher prevalence of amputations and two thirds to only 25% of patients uh, developed ulcers when they wore an irremovable uh, removable device. So clearly the outcomes again, uh, when we're looking at salvage are better. But the difficulty is to know when to stop offloading um, and we don't have anything that's reliable to tell us when. So basically we look at the edema being resolved, which is a good sign of an acute inflammatory process. So we know the acute phase could be over. And also we've stabilized the temperature between the feet, again, presuming it's a unilateral presentation. There are also adjunctive therapies uh, that we use and those target the basic cellular and metabolic uh, osseous changes. We know there's an altered metabolism from the hyperglycemia most cases, the hyperlipidemia as well. And they, through a number of uh, pathways, can affect the, uh, the osseous metabolism to favor the osteoclast and the breakdown here. But again, the pathophysiology um, is not well understood yet. We, we know that it affects this system with uh, rank, rankle, and osteopagaritin, um, the OPG uh, pathway here. Uh, stimulating osteoblasts versus osteoclasts and supposed to be maintaining that, that uh, homeostasis between them. So bone stimulation is known to do that, whether low intensity pulse ultrasound or electromagnetic um, stimulation. And we know we have pharmaceutical um, uh, opportunities with bisphosphonates, calcitonin, 
And also now we're looking at uh, Rankle inhibitors to, to stop that ligand from binding the receptor and, and promoting the osteoclast uh, uh, function. Unfortunately, the, there's insufficient evidence. There are some favorable studies on bisphosphonates. Um, you can see here, two of them have improved clinical symptoms, one of which uh, bone uh, turnover uh, markers for, for catabolism of, of bone, uh, eight weeks versus almost 19 weeks uh, when using the bisphosphonate. But these were small studies. They were um, somewhat controlled, uh, but there was some inherent bias in the methodology. The other issue with bisphosphonates is to obviously be careful with renal insufficiency, which is also unfortunately a very common uh, complication in Charcot foot. We know a lot of patients also have uh, renal uh, chronic uh, kidney disease, uh, many could be on uh, dialysis um, or even had a renal transplant. Uh, so we have to be cautious with using bisphosphonates. And again, uh, any of these adjunctive therapies are still, uh, there's insufficient evidence to support them. But I think for me, one of the biggest issues is when you switch to, what, what do you do when you stop that total contact cast or that instant total contact cast? And I don't think we stop the immobilization, that's not the point. We don't wanna stop the offloading. So we transition to a removable knee-high device, uh, a crow walker, a Charco restraint, orthosis walker uh, is, is typically what I would use. I find it to be um, more comfortable than the others because it's customized on the inside here. Um, and it can help transfer a lot of the, the pressure and redistribute the pressures uh, when there is a deformity. It can accommodate that deformity well and decrease uh, ulcers and infections. Um, and then we have uh, managing the infection as the third principle. So the issue is, does this make it lead us to a delayed or misdiagnosis or is there a concurrent infection or none of the above? And there is no infection. Uh, many times it's just mistaken. Um, so we know that neuropathy is common in both. Uh, in fact, as I said, a universal finding in Charcot. But we have to ask ourselves, is there an ulcer? Because if there's no ulcer, it is a lot less likely to have the infection. Are there signs and symptoms? Well, we know that's gonna be an acute red hot swollen foot, but are there other signs? We know infection will have secondary signs like the friable skin, um, which can also clearly present with Charcot as all of these can because they're nonspecific. Uh, but you can, you can look at, you know, obviously if there's drainage, it's a lot more clear, uh, but laboratory findings will help, imaging tests can help. Although imaging gets rather uh, confusing and complicated sometimes, not always clarifying things. We know that there are three factors that predict failure when we go on to surgery. Uh, presence of an ulcer, uh, we know that there's a seven times increased risk of extremity, lower extremity amputation in a DFU, a diabetic foot ulcer. But when we add Charcot, it goes up to 12 times uh, the risk. Uh, location of the ulcer, the more proximal the ulcer, the more likely to have a major lower extremity amputation. And then lateral, lateral column instability. So if the deformity is more on the lateral column of the foot, uh, there's a higher likelihood of ulcer forming uh, or an amputation happening. So our treatment goal when we do these reconstructions is to just develop a stable plantar grade foot because we want to create a stable platform that someone can maximize their function and quality of life. Okay, so when looking at those diagnostic uh, tests, looking at, um, at imaging, an MRI is one of the better tests that we can order because it can help us distinguish the two, although it's still rather challenging. We have periarticular tissues and bone that can look the same in both uh, entities here. Edema, ulcerations, they both can have it. Uh, osteomyelitis and, and charco both can fragment bone, sublux, resorb, and have erosions present, uh, which you can see in this image that it's still hard to tell what we're really dealing with. What distinguishes them more is the subchondral cysts, interarticular bodies that you may see, and rim enhancement um, in the neuropathic joint versus fluid collections and sinus tracts that you may see. Uh, neuropathic joints, the bone marrow edema is more uh, subchondral compared to being more diffuse and in multiple bones and osteomyelitis. More recently, we've looked at PET scans and PET scans have a greater specificity than MRI, better positive and negative predictive values. Uh, so it's likely a better test, especially in the acute foot for distinguishing them, but they're less, uh, less accessible and, and a lot more cost, uh, often being prohibitive. 
So I show you this algorithm because I want you to see here that when you develop an ulcer with an acute charco foot, we have to be real cautious. And as I said, managing the infection because it's a different pathway. It's the first step is to distinguish of infection versus um, using a non-removable device, which you're not gonna put on an infected draining wound. You'll have to have a removable device. And as soon as the infection's managed, then we can go back and put a non-removable device on and try and limit the deformity from progressing even more. Uh, so managing, this just highlights the, the importance of infection. When we do decide surgical correction is necessary, it's a complex syndrome um, that we're dealing with here. It often involves poor outcomes and, and patients who are very unhealthy often, uh, and they have decreased function and they're unstable. So it's really not a good mix to take them to surgery if we can help it. Uh, but if necessary to salvage the limb, which we know can preserve their life, then often the, risk, the benefits can outweigh the risk depending on what we're dealing with. So just uh, quickly, I wanna go over just here's a case to kind of highlight some of this, um, these principles. And this person came to me uh, referred by infectious disease. They had been trying to manage what they thought was a, an infection uh, that they drained pus from with a small stab incision uh, in the office because the patient was neuropathic. Um, they said they were draining pus. Uh, there was never a culture that was positive and there was never any purulence when you go back and look at it. Um, and, and evaluate the case more effectively. So this was managed for about six months this way with repeated um, drainages in the office. So I finally sent him over to me and I saw this small ulcer with this fibrous wound uh, surrounding erythema and edema. And with x-rays, it was clear that this was a charco foot. Uh, so I thought, but when I got the x-rays, you can see here the medial cuneiform uh, over here, how it's extruded medially. Uh, the first metatarsal is articulating more at the second cuneiform than the, than the medial, but it also looks like diffuse erosions and um, cysts and other things that can be very consistent with a chronic osteomyelitis. So I went on to get an MRI, uh, and of course that was also inconclusive because um, it had characteristics of both based on the list that we just even looked at. You can clearly see characteristics uh, of both. You see uh, subchondral cysts uh, throughout here but it's also a very diffuse pattern of bone marrow edema. So I went on to do a bone biopsy because the last thing I'd wanna do is try and reconstruct this unstable medial column uh, collapse and go on to an amputation. Uh, but I certainly didn't wanna do it and spread osteomyelitis to lead to a baloney amputation. Uh, so the multiple bone biopsies from uh, multiple bones uh, all came back negative when I was, so I was convinced there was no infection at this point. So I went on to go ahead and manage her uh, surgically. So I realigned the foot with uh, this arthrodesis at multiple levels, um, actually using, so on the left here, we have the preoperative, this is the medial cuneiform kind of popping out. Once we plane that, we wedge the bone to realign it and reconstruct a, an arch with uh, no weight bearing uh, on any osseous structure anymore and went on to have a, a much better um, architecture to the foot. This was all soft tissue on the bottom now, uh, fibers from the chronic inflammation that had converted it to fibrous tissue, but was not, um, it was not a rigid or hard surface they were walking on. It was actually rather soft and uh, non-weight bearing. So she went on to do very well uh, with this because we managed, the, we managed it to make sure there was no infection, go down the right path, uh, the only thing I wish is that we had caught this much sooner. There would have been a lot less destruction um, because what can go wrong will. Uh, these patients, um, we can't underestimate what Shargo can do with their collapse. All this rigid fixation and you can see, you know, loosening of screws and they back out. You can see loosening of screws in plates that back out so you have no stability anymore and actually even fracturing screws uh, if you use too small of a screw. So we really have to use the largest um, internal and external fixation that we can, if necessary, uh, to stabilize the joints when, and, and fuse them and stabilize them so they can heal properly. And that often means making a super construct where the uh, hardware crosses multiple joints that are uh, stable and healthy joints, not just the joint we're trying to fuse. So really the other key is prevention is the best thing we can do when we're dealing with this challenging and debilitating consequence uh, is uh, to prevent it altogether. Uh, tight sugar control, 
uh, and let's just not see this type of foot because it's it's a uh, it's challenging uh, and the outcomes overall are generally poor. They are getting better. There are now studies showing up to you know 80% success rates, but it's still just a challenging foot that has a lot of a uh, lot of poor outcomes that we need to prevent. So that'll conclude my talk. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Jonathan, for a very nice presentation and very nice take-home messages which you have shown in in uh, in your slides. And yes, we have to uh, keep in mind the importance of temperature difference, which we have shown is very important. Uh, I think on the day one, when the patient is coming to the clinic, this should be the uh, take-home message that if there's any change of difference or in temperature between the two foot, uh, one should always think of sharp words at the back of the mind. And a very important message which you have shown is do not underestimate sharp words. That is also very important for all the attendants here. We should never underestimate sharp words. You have also shown us the importance of bone biopsy. That's very important whenever we have to go for sharp, surgical sharp words. Always go for bone biopsy, look for the bug which is growing over there and then hit the bug with the antibiotics or with surgical correction and take rid, get rid of that bone which is getting osteomyelitic. Realignment orthodesis is also very important and one should not be hesitant to do that. And we also have to keep in mind what can go wrong and will go wrong. That is also a very important slide. I, I like your slide uh, very much and a phrase that what will go wrong will go wrong. So one should think of the uh, uh, initial things or the past things which can happen to a diabetic foot patients. Surgical correction with a non-weight bearing, this is also very important. We have to offload the uh, pressure. We have to use AFOs, TCC cars, and whatever method, tell the patient not to put the foot on the ground. And ground should be the last thing in the patient's mind where to put the foot, down. whether they can use wheelchair, crutches, or be in bed, total offloading should be the concept. And I think the patient comes to my clinic, day one, I tell the patient, whatever you do, whatever you can do, don't put your foot on the ground. Or if you have to put the foot on the ground, you have to use TCC, AFOs, charcoal, scroll walker, and we have to do a total walk, uh, offloading. Very important thing is, charcoal foot is most challenging consequence of diabetic neuropathy. If we can take care of neuropathy, this is the thing which we have to keep in mind. And because this is one of the consequences of neuropathy, because you and me will have a pain when we develop any biomechanical disturbance in the foot. But the sharp cuts foot or sharp cuts patient will keep on walking on that foot because of the neuropathy. So it is known as uh, neuroarthropathy so because this is the alignment of the foot which get damaged because of diabetic neuropathy. Thank you so much, Dr. Jonathan, for a nice presentation. And uh, I welcome, uh, we have uh, two very important uh, people here. We were not able to give you an introduction, Dr. Rajneesh Saxena. He's a senior diabetologist and foot care specialist working in Ajmer. He's the national secretary for Indian Podiatry Association and president of Rajasthan chapter of Indian Podiatry Association. And also we have Dr. Ravi Kamipuli from Georgia, uh, Atlanta, Georgia from USA. He's also joined it. He's the vice president of Indian Podiatry Association. He's basically passed on from uh, Guntur Medical College from uh, Andhra Pradesh. He's a board certified infectious disease physician and epidemiologist working in USA. And he has a vast experience in wound care. And he's a diplomat of a medical board of obesity medicine. And he has a separate group of keto medicine, which is going on. And I'm proud to say, I think more than 400 or 500 people are following him uh, doing this. So welcome Ravi and Rajni Saxena uh, over there. So uh, I reflect. Uh, I, I'll firstly, without wasting any time, I will go down to a presentation on diabetic foot infections. Again, as Charcot foot is there, we all know that we have to take care of infections. Any uh, person who's dealing into diabetic foot care, the day in the patient comes to your clinic, this is the something which you have to take care and think of that what type of infections uh, the patient has. So what we'll be covering uh, today will be some data on diabetic uh, infections and consensus guidelines on uh, diabetic foot infections. I'll start my presentation with this uh, 40 years of uh, wild watch uh, saying, 
identification of the infective organism has become necessary for appropriate antibiotic treatment, bone biopsy, as it has been officiated by Dr. Jonathan just now, and culture. These two things are very important. We should always think of bone biopsy and culture should be done. An optimum level and duration of antibiotic therapy in these infections is purely arbitrary. Uh, arbitrary. This is, uh, a, was presented in NEGM in 1980s, about 40 years behind from what we are in 2020. In osteomyelitis, uh, 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 it has been about 40 years. And still, I think, uh, whatever I'm going to speak today and showing you in the next 30 or 40 slides, I think this thing covers everything that what we have to see, we have to see the infective organism. And still 40 years down the line, this uh, uh, phrase still be uh, is a proof of that. So if you look at diaptic foot infection guidelines, many diaptic foot guidelines before 2004 were referred to as infection which is present or absent. Either we will say infection is there or infection is not there. But since 2004, two expert committees were developed to draft the guidelines. These were International Working Group on Diaptic Foot, uh, Diaptic Foot, which is known as IWGDF, now translated into more than 20 languages. And the other is Infectious Disease Society of America, IDSA, which has over 970 citations and more than uh, 1 million downloads are present over there. If you look at this is IW GDF guideline, which is expert opinion on the management of infection. And the main group of working over there were Dr. Lipsky, Peters, and a lot of uh, uh, good people with Jeff Cott and uh, uh, Levery, and everyone was there. And since a lot of uh, recommendations has come down now since last uh, 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 10 to 15 years of time. Another guideline, which is IDSA guideline, which is 2012 Infectious Disease Society of America, Clinical practice guideline for the diagnosis and treatment of diaptic foot infections is also running over there. And we have to follow these guidelines. IWGDF risk certification, which says, if we look at the uh, diaptic foot yeah. category 0, 1, 2, and 3, we have very low infection where, where patients uh, have uh, uh, no history of knobs or PAD, that is uh, in a neuropathy and no PAD. If the patient has got category one, they have neuropathy or PAD. In a moderate uh, uh, risk category, we have patients who have neuropathy and PAD. And PAD and foot deformities are present over there in the patient or any of the foot deformities is present. And high risk patient, which is category three, which has patient have neuropathy or peripheral arterial disease, History of foot ulcer, lower extremity amputation, either a minor amputation or a midfoot amputation or a forefoot amputation, and or a patient have end stage renal disease, then we can categorize this patient into uh, category three or high risk group. If we look at IDSA guidelines, there are 10 key, uh, key questions to it. So I'll go to the questions uh, one by one. When to suspect and how to classify a diaptic foot infection, that when we have to see that there's a diaptic foot infection in a diaptic patient, how to assess the wound, foot, and the patient itself. We don't have to look at the uh, foot only or the infection only. We have to look at the patient also. How is his sugar control? How much is his uh, critical uh, limb ischemia? Whether he, this patient has got nephropathy or CKD, what is this albumin level, which is very important for a wound healing, uh, wound healing. So all these things we have to look for the patient. We have to look at the foot deformities, whether this patient have a low arch foot, high arch foot, high callus foot, excessive pronation, excessive supination, or he has hallux valgus, he has clotos or hematos. So whatever the biomechanics of the foot is there, we have to look whenever a patient of diabetic foot comes. And then consensually, whether it's a midfoot ulcer with a sharp cuts foot, total collapse of the medial arch. So these are few things or important things we should always keep in mind whenever we are seeing the patient with this. And when and with whom to consult. This is also very important. When to refer it to a diabetic foot specialist or to the orthopedic friend or to a surgical friend or to a vascular surgeon. So this is all important in the IDSA guidelines for diabetic foot infection. When to hospitalize the patient. If his urea and creatinine are increasing, he's going into septicemia. We have to admit patient, necrotizing fasciitis. We should immediately get the patient inside, IV antibiotics, 
when I was working in US, I used to see necrotizing fasciitis coming in Boston hospital where I was working. And the day one, one, one of the days I was passing to the emergency department, the nurse over there was referring the patient to the uh, HBOT department. So I asked her that why she's sending it to HBOT, whether when the patient needs surgery. So she said, when they are preparing it for the surgery or the OT, so they are utilizing that time of one hour to give HBOT to the patient to save the dying tissue because the pre high pressure oxygen can save the patient's uh, dying tissues when of more oxygen can be given to that. So that is something we'll, we have to think of that and when to hospitalize the patient is important. When and how to take culture as you have just seen and how to select and modify antibiotic regimen. This is also very important and what we are going to talk in the next 10 slides, you'll come to know about that. And Dr. Jashin will also tell you about one of the very new antibiotics uh, which has come in the market and which is present in, the, in, in our uh, country now, uh, Levonadifloxin, and uh, he will take you through to that. Also, IDSC guidelines shows us when and which imaging studies to do, whether we have to get CT scan, MRI, X-rays, PET scan, what we have to do and how to diagnose and treat osteomyelitis is very important. Diagnosis, diagnosing of osteomyelitis, so I'll be covering in some of my slides that. When is surgery needed or ordered? <clears throat> when is surgery needed and ordered, as you said, and what wound care and dressings to be used? We have a lot of new dressings when the wood is too wet, we have to use the dressing, uh, which will uh, take away the discharge. When the wound is dry, we need to have dressing which can maintain moisture on the wound. If there's a cavity, we need to have a dressing which can fill up that cavity. So all these things, we have to have it to the guidelines. And these are 10 very important questions we should always keep in mind when we are dealing with diabetic foot infections in our patients. Coming down to clinical classification in diabetic foot infections. In uh, I, IW GDF classification, which is PDS and IDSA guideline, stage one is patient when there's uninfected patient or stage one in PDS classification, there's no prolence or no inflammation and simply patient has come with a small blister or small infection over there. So at that stage, we just need to offload the foot, the forefoot area. There's no need of giving any antibiotics at this stage, but the role of hydrogen is very important. We have to maintain moist environment on this use a dressing advice to the patient and i think this patient this wound will heal in about say one to two weeks of time very nicely so there's this is something which is pds1 or idsa uninfected also second we will come down to pds2 or mild infection when there's infection patient has rhythma around the ulcer and the infection is limited only to the skin. This is also very important that the infection is limited only to the skin and have not gone deep into the infection. Stage three PDS or moderate infection according to the IDSA could be cellulitis more than two centimeters deep. Patient could have gangrene, patient could have infection going to the muscle, tendon, bones are involved. And these type of infection along with cellulitis could be grade three or moderate uh, clinical classification of diabetic foot infection. Coming down to stage four, or it could be severe classification when the patient has systemic toxicity and metabolic instability with spreading infection, which you can see over here, going down to the foot. And this is also very common in diabetic foot infection patients uh, when, when, when they are getting it. So we have to see all these four classification as the patient is coming to our clinic so that we are able to guide our treatment modalities according to the grading of the classification. So treatment could be different at stage one, treatment could be a little different at stage two with them just oral antibiotics, offloading, giving, taking care of the sugars and other things, good dressings at this stage. Treatment would be different at stage three or moderate when we have to give them, put them on IV antibiotics according to the culture. Taking culture is very important. Offloading is important. Sugar control is important along with dressings. But in stage four, here comes the role of when we have to hospitalize this patient, IV antibiotic shifting down to oral later on, surgical intervention has to be done, but also we have to think of revascularization. So all the four stages of classification will go according to our treatment guidelines and we have to treat these patients according to the classification. So this is also very important. Microbiology in diabetic foot infection is very important. We have to think of gram positive, gram negative, and anaerobic infection. Most of the bugs, they grow together in diabetic foot infections. When we see as a tertiary care center, when the patient is coming, 
to my center, I, I see more of gram negatives now in last many years, like 10 years. Gram positives will be very less and robic infection will be very high. So chronicity, depth, necrosis, this all depends upon that what is the stage when the patient is coming. In the stage one, the patient might have only the gram positive. Stage two, stage three, patient will be more of the gram negatives and anaerobic infection. But we know in diabetic patient, microbial complexity is more and it is a polymicrobial. They will have all three bugs growing in the wound together. So there's a study in West Asia, which has shown in a lot of these South Asian countries, you can see China, Mongolia, Indonesia, and Thailand, which shows different bugs which are growing together. But it is the culture we have to take. It has to go to the deep wound cavities, INDs, we need to send the abscess or the tissue cultures, which will give us the bug which is growing. But we have to take care of pseudomonas. We have to take care of E. coli, which is very common in diabetic foot patients. Staff, we, I'm just going to share in the next two slides over there. There has been a study which has been done in central part of this uh, Asia, which is Turkey. Some studies which have been done in Asia and some studies which have been done in Europe. What we see in Asia, more gram positives are about 32%. Gram negatives are at about 51%. So the more of the gram negatives what we are seeing in our South Asian countries covering China, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, uh, Sri Lanka, and Cambodia, Vietnam, and Taiwan, these type of countries. Whereas in Europe, we see gram positives are about 70%. So more of the gram positives we are seeing in Europe. I don't know the answer to this. I think panelists can discuss. And gram negatives are about 80, 20%. And when we have seen some studies in Turkey, gram positives are 48%, gram negatives are 48%. So that shows in Turkey, the reason to this, again, we really don't know. Turkey has equal of gram positives and negatives, where Asia has more of gram negatives and Europe has more of gram positives. So this shows that it is polymicrobial. Diabetic foot is present in every nook and corner of the world, every city, every place we have diabetic foot infections. So different bugs are growing in different places. So these are more of the studies which have come up and seen. Just to highlight you, head of the snake concept. I think everyone listening to this webinar should know this head of the snake concept. In the snake, if you cut the head from here, the whole of his body is nothing. It is not dangerous to us. And this part of the snake is only dangerous. So head of the snake in diabetic foot infection is Staph aureus and beta hemolytic streptococcus. So if you kill the bugs with your antibiotics early and cut the head of the snake, I think most of your work has been done and your patient will be successful with your treatment. Looking down to antimicrobial therapies, again, in mild, we need to take care of the oral antibiotics. It's mainly outpatient. One to two weeks of oral antibiotics needs to be given. This is according to the IDSA guidelines. In moderate infection, oral plus minus IV antibiotic, mostly outpatient, two to three weeks of antibiotic. And in severe cases, we have to take the patient inside and hit them with IV, switch down to oral antibiotics are common. So everything, I think we should keep this slide in mind and whenever we are seeing patient according to this, according to the mild, moderate or severe classification of IDSA guideline, we should follow this. If infection goes to the bone and we resected the bone or we have debrided the bone or there are no surgery, these are the three conditions that osteomyelitis have occurred. In when resection of the bone, we have to give IV antibiotics shifting to oral, mainly patient will be inpatient, less than one week of an antibiotic is sufficient because we have taken, uh, we have got rid of the, the bone, which is causing that osteomyelitis. Also, when patient has got, we have debrided the bone. This is also very common that when we are debrided the bone, not remove the total bone, then four to six weeks of oral or IV antibiotics is needed. And when the patient doesn't, is not fit for surgery, either he has low ejection fraction, we cannot take in the operation theater, or patient's compliance is not there, or whatever the reason, he has severe CKD on dialysis, and other reasons are there where we can't do surgery on a the patient, then mainly in an outpatient department, more than three months of oral or IV antibiotics is indicated according to the cultures. So they are both the things are there. In diabetic foot infections and osteo osteomyelitis, I'll cover down in some of my slides over here. So we need to keep this slide in mind. So make it uh, easy for you to remember in mild, one to two weeks, in moderate, two to three weeks, and in severe IV antibiotics, switch to oral in something like two to three weeks. Again, this is my Lipsky from IDSA guidelines. And we need to follow this. And I think 
if we follow this this is something which is gold standard all over the world in any part of the world this is gold standard another classification which we have to think is wifi classification this is also coming up in diabetic foot care now and most of the podiatry and wound care centers when a patient comes to us we have wound we have ischemia and we have foot infection these three things will be there in the in the foot of the patient now go, uh, score zero will be no ulcer score one will be small ulcer which i have just shown without any gangrene or anything score two will be a deeper ulcer more than the subcutaneous tissue and which has gone to the bone joint or tendon and stage 3 w3 will be extensive ulcer deep it will be a deep ulcer which is a full thickness ulcer mainly on the heel or middle part of the foot any of the bone will be involved and extensive gangrene could be there so then it will be w3 so we need to classify our bones according to the w0 w1 w2 and w3 similarly i stands in wifi is ischemia we have to take care of the abi index of these patients if the stage 0 will be abi index more than 0.8 if if the abi index is 0.6 to 0.8 will stage at i1 0.4 to 0.6 will be i2 and less than 0.4 will be i3 now rather than we know in the most of the diabetic foot infections we have classification and false abi is just a separate chapter we cannot discuss over here so we rely more on tcpo2 but yes tcpo2 is not available in all the centers so these are tcpo2 studies which we can say more than 60 between 40 to 60 between 30 to 40 and less than 30 would be i3 coming down to foot infections again zero will be no signs of infection uh wi uh, wifi uh, fi will be local infection f2 will be local infection which involves a deeper or a subcutaneous tissue and deep 3 will be systemic inflammation or a syndrome where patient will have sepsis so we can do wifi classification and get a get a score and according to that score we can see whether our wound will heal or what other we have to refer this patient to vascular surgeon refer this patient to bigger surgical um, uh, reconstruction surgery or the conservative surgery it always depends upon our wifi classification we know in diabetic patients in the, if we look at the pathophysiology for diabetic foot wounds we have to classify ischemia will be there and foot infection is always there in most of these patients so some patients will have only infection some patient will have wound and infection some patients can have wound with ischemia some patient might have ischemia and infection where are some category of patient have wounds with ischemia with diabetic foot infection and these are the most difficult patients to treat because no the level of amputation or the scope of amputation is very high in these patients when they have w i and v i together so we have to keep in mind that whether we have to see for ischemia how we have to see for foot infection what type of bugs are growing and whether our wound is deep in the subcutaneous tissue has gone to the bones or has gone to this now you see a patient over here <clears throat> he has this x ray so what we can do in this picture and if the patient refuses to go for any surgery so this is something which i am seeing over here patient might have an ulcer or patient might not have an ulcer so what is the point of diagnosis that what bug is growing and whether i have to treat this foot or treat this patient or no very simple is bone probing this is one of the very simplest thing we should all keep in mind we should all practice this and very blunt this this should be with a with a very blunt object like this we can just have the uh, nothing is available with an artery forceps and put it in the wound and see whether we are touching on the foot of the patient but this test doesn't have a very strong specificity if we look at that <coughs> the sensitivity if you look at that probing to the bone has 73% only sensitivity but specificity is 96% which shows that when we probe to the bone i know that my wound is my probe is touching to the bone of the uh, foot of the patient patient has infection in the bone patient might have got the wound is touching on the bone whether he has got infection inside that is 73% so this shows that specificity is low of this test but sensitivity specificity is high we can do going for x ray and esr or other biomarkers and mri which shows 100% sensitivity and 75% specificity we'll come to the slide later on but this shows that we need to with the probing of the bone is positive we need to go for x ray and we need to go for mri which has got the highest uh, sensitivity for our uh, to diagnose for osteomyelitis 
the presence of exposed bone or a positive probe to the bone test is moderately predictive of osteoarthritis it is only moderate you have to keep this in mind because but we need to keep that if i am probing to the bone i am sure that my wound has gone to the infection and i need to investigate more to get rid of that infection which might be there in the in the in the foot of the patient so MRI is the most accurate imaging test for the diagnosis of osteomyelitis. This paper was presented in 2008, <clears throat> many years before, and it is still true uh, uh, for that. It's a long history, bone infection. We need to take clinical history. We need to examine the patient. Probing to the bone is very important. We need to do the blood markers and X-ray, radionuclide, WBC scan, MRI, and PET CT, PET or CT, PET MRI positioning can also be done. And bone biopsy, as done by Dr. Jonathan, is very important for culture and histology, which should be the gold standard. So, if I'm probing to the bone, I need to get X-ray done. I need to get MRI, clinical examination, blood markers, and everything. We have to get thing of this uh, for uh, treat for the osteomyelitis. If I go for IWGDF antibiotic consensus, there's no specific agent which has shown to be most effective. Effective. That is very important. Whether I treat with uh, miropenems, imipenems, vancomycins, or fluoroquinolones, <clears throat> there's no specific agent which has shown to be most effective. It only depends upon our clinical acumen and <clears throat> culture reports. What our culture is growing into this. Empiric coverage should include staff, anti-staff, as I've shown you by the snake model, including MRSA. And I think Dr. Jashed will let you know about a very good antibiotic, which is an Indian antibiotic, which has recently come. And we have an MRS, very good MRSA coverage with that. No data indicates priority of any particular route of administration, whether I'm giving oral, I'm giving intravenous, or shifting from intravenous to oral antibiotic. And there's no data to inform duration of therapy also. This also says we have a guidelines, but antibiotic consensus is something different and IDSA guidelines appears useful to us. So that shows that we need to follow the guidelines. But yes, what I'm going to show you here is that we need to have empiric coverage. And according to the cultures, we have to hit our antibiotics and hit and get the patient uh, get over there. So more knowledge on this, you can get on our www.iwg.org. Uh, uh, Duration of therapy, as I said, with osteomyelitis, there's no residual infected tissues, two to five days is sufficient. Residual infected soft tissue, two to four weeks. Infected bone, four to six weeks of antibiotic. And if patient is not ready for surgery, consensus is not, consent is not there, or he's not fit for surgery, more than three months is indicative for the duration of therapy. Again, this is from the IDSA dietary food guidelines. So we all need to remember this. Empirical basis. Antibiotic therapy alone has worked for every one of us. Any patient comes to any one of us, all the attendees who are listening to this webinar, I think everyone uses antibiotic according to our choice, according to the availability, and it works for us. It is not that um, uh, you are practicing in your clinic and after this webinar, your antibiotics will work. No, you are using all the antibiotics and they are all working and you are treating your patients. But there are some situations where you cannot do surgery or give six weeks or IV antibiotics. So that has to be a consensus group, whether I have to give an empirical therapy on this or I have to go according to the cultures. There are some surgical interventions in diaptic foot infections. Most infected wounds require debridement. We should not be hesitant of debridement. Sometimes I see patients are taking long time antibiotics given by some uh, clinician friends of us but debridement has not been done. But there's a diaptic foot ulcer, we should not be hesitant of debridement. Debridement is the first line of treatment. Whether you give antibiotics or you don't give antibiotics, you need to get rid of that tissue, get rid of that bone or get rid of that infected tissue is very important. And IND is very important, we need to do that. Seek surgical consultation for infection with gas in the deeper tissues, abscesses, non-viable tissue, necrotizing fascia is very important. We need to do early fasciotomy. Early, there are a lot of data available and a lot of hundreds of papers available on early fasciotomies in necrotizing fasciitis along with intravenous antibiotics. Extensive bone or joint involvement, bully, neurological loss. Surgeon should have the knowledge of foot anatomy and experience in dealing with diabetic foot infection. And that is what we are doing under IPA. And all my core group, we are proud to say that we are giving this knowledge, giving seminars and CMEs before these webinars. During the time of COVID, we have been doing workshops regularly for last more than 10 years. We are doing all across the country and even in South Asia. We have done seminars in Malaysia, 
in uh, Nepal we have done, Sri Lanka we have done. So that's what we are doing and spreading education that surgeons should have the knowledge of foot anatomy. And, but very important that we need to have limb uh, arterial uh, supply and revascularization is very important. So you keep on giving antibiotic, you keep on doing debridement, offloading, dressings. But if the blood is not coming there, your wound will not heal. So that we have to take care of the culture. Uh, along with the cultures, we have to take care of ABI index, TCPO2, and we have to get rid of this. Surgical intervention in diabetic foot infection. Sound well. Surgical intervention in diabetic foot infection is common. We need to take care of these central places or surgical. So we're not covering this into this webinar. And a lot of adjuvantic therapies are there for diabetic foot infection, like hyperbaric oxygen therapy. We all know that it works over there. It brings more uh, oxygen to the wound bed. It also works as an antiseptic. It works as an antimicrobial because it has done the wound healing process. The more, develop, more uh, um, uh, delivery of the leukocytes and lymphocytes are over there to the wound, to the bed of the wound, and we uh, have the proper healing of the wound occurs with this. Granulocyte colony stimulating factors may reduce the need for surgery, including lower extremity amputation. Maggot therapy is not uh, practiced any uh, most of the places in the world is not. And I said we can go. There are a lot of new techniques of doing debridement and antibiotics. So maggot therapy is at the back step over there. So not used as an agentic therapy. But advanced dressings are there. As I said, we have uh, dressing foam dressing, silver silver impregnated foam dressings are there which have the capacity to suck away the discharge from the exudative wound. We have silver-based treatment which works as an antibiotic and um, antimicrobial and helps in the uh, preventing the formation of the biofilm. That is also very important because we know because there's any wound over here, it will take six to 12 weeks of time. And biofilm is bound to develop over here. So we have a lot of antibiotics, we have a lot of antimicrobials, a lot of cleaning agents are there. And silver-based dressings have come in as many hydrogel. They are silver impregnated hydrogels are there, which will prevent the formation of biofilm. So this is also very important. We can use in our practices to get rid of the infection. But very important is negative pressure uh, therapy is there. In diabetic foot infection, uh, whatever I'm going to say in next three or four slide, I think the very common is choice depends upon the individual experience. So everyone working, as I said, uses antibiotic according to your choices, according to the availability and whatever you are practicing in your, um, in, in, for your patients. But we have cephalosporins, levofloxacins, MRSA is very important. We need to get rid of that in our patients, but that has to go according to the cultures. So they are all different type of antibiotics, which I'm not going to go into detail, which apparent clindamycin is very common. We need to use that in, the, in our most of the patients. Levofloxacin, piperacillin, tazobactam for gram negatives is very important. Imipenems, we have vancomycins, we have metronidazole, we have for the anaerobic infection. So all antibiotics, again, choice depends upon the individual experience is very common. MRSA, if we need to cover this, linozolid is one product which is available. And I think empirically, when you are waiting for your cultures to come, this is one product we can use in your practices. But now one of the new products which Dr. Jashis is just going to talk after me is levonadifloxacin, which is a fluoroquinone, 800 milligram. And we'll discuss that it has intravenous and oral preparations. And this is a good product, which is hitting on the MRSA, covering gram positives and anaerobic, not very effective for gram negatives. But as these two bugs, we can cover nicely in our diabetic foot and soft tissue infection. And a lot of data is available now in diabetic foot infections and soft tissue infections. And even uh, it has some data available on osteomyelitis, like bone penetration, we have to see. Pseudomonas aeruginosa is something which we need to keep in mind. Pepersin tazobactam uh, group is active against this, but very effective that we need to take care of the cultures and according to that, we say that. So I will conclude with this, that diabetic foot infections are common, complex, and costly problem because that takes away most of the cost for the patient. Classification is based on the severity. We need to take uh, keep in mind of ischemia. If ischemia is present, we have to go according to the guidelines, which are present, and we need to classify our bones. Costive organism, gram-positive, gram-negatives, and aerobics have shown 
antibiotic therapy, we need to choose empiric therapy, and then we need to move down to definitive therapy. One should not go according to the empirical therapy. Sometimes what happens is that we are giving an empiric therapy and our wound starts to heal, and we see that infection is coming down, but we need to go to the definitive therapy according to the microorganism which grows over there. So one should always be mind of taking cultures on day one, the patient, you are seeing the patient. Patients some need the bright band, IND, and revascularization is important. Osteomyelitis is difficult to diagnose and difficult to treat sometimes. Adjunctive measurements are occasionally helpful, but most of the time I see in my practice, they help, we should. Now we are using, other than hyperbaric, we are using ozone therapy. Ozone works very well. It is a topical uh, antimicrobial. It kills most of the bugs. And uh, very nicely, we have done something like more than 100 patients have got by pseudomonas. Pseudomonas is there, and we have treated with antibiotics, of course, but also with ozone therapy, bagging of the food. Now, topical oxygen is coming up in a big way. Warm oxygen is coming up in a big way. So these are all adjunctive therapies uh, uh, which will help there. But multidisciplinary team improves the outcome. This is always seen when we have a clinician as a diaptologist, a wound care specialist, a podiatrist, and a vascular surgeon together working. And data shows in all the international hospitals where multidisciplinary teamwork is there for diabetic foot infection. And when we discuss with a microbiologist, we should always try to discuss with the microbiologist. And when we see our results are more better and really the amputation rate is literally negligible. So these are the things we should add, but we should always keep in mind that we need to maintain the beauty of the feet. We need to prevent this type of amputation where very quickly, if the patient is coming to us, we check for neuropathy, we check for peripheral arterial disease, we prevent the formation, give him preventive education is very important at day one when the patient has neuropathy so that he doesn't get into all these things which we have taught in Dr. Jonathan and me have taught that we need to prevent that. And whenever the infection has turned, tell the patient they can do small dressings at home rather than initially before they come to our centers. And sometimes patients keep on doing dressing themselves and they don't come to the medical center. They quite come quite late. It's very common in our country. So we need to give a proper education. The role of a diabetes educator is also very common. But for diabetic foot infection, we need to follow the guidelines. We need to take care of the infection. We need to take care of the cultures, uh, vascularization. And then we have to take care according to the antibiotics. Thank you so much. Uh, questions we can take after Dr. Jashit's uh, presentation. Um, this. Uh, yeah. Uh, Dr. Jashit? Yes. You can? Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Surisar. And uh, uh, Dr. Surisar has nicely took us uh, through the, the uh, diabetic foot infections and what are the challenges we face uh, during, while treating the diabetic foot infections. And the, in the next uh, 10 to 12 minutes, let me introduce the new molecule MROC, which is levonidiflorcetin, and we have an oral formulation as well, who are patented new advanced antibiotic for diabetic foot infections. We know that the, since the discovery of penicillin, very antibiotics were introduced, whether they will be in, they are either uh, discovered in US, Europe, or in Japan. And this is the first time an Indian company has discovered and introduced a new chemical entity antibiotic. So we know these challenges in the management of diabetic foot infections. And as Dr. Suri said, majority of infections are polymicrobial infections. So we require a broader spectrum initially and then de-escalate as according to the culture report. An agent which has a better penetration, an agent need, because biofilm is a major concern, an agent which has an antibiofilm activity, and an agent having activity in acidic medium, we know that in first abscess and in diabetic food infection, at the site of infection, other will be a relatively lower pH. So we require an agent which has an activity in acidic environment. And, and diabetic food infections will be having a lot of concomitant medications, including sulfonylureas or DPP4 inhibitors. And those agents have reported drug drug interaction with antibiotics. And we require an agent with minimal drug drug interaction. An agent, because of course safety is a major concern and we require an agent with a better safety profile. With this, we, let me introduce the two new chemical entity antibiotics, MROC, which is the IV formulation, levonidiflopsacin, and MROC O, which is ala levonidiflopsacin, which is a pro-drug of levonidiflopsacin with alanine amino acid, which will be absorbed from the intestinal epithelium very rapidly. 
And within the intestinal epithelium itself, it will be rapidly converted into the active formulation with the help of enzyme esterase. Therefore, the bioavailability of the oral formulation is very high, more than 90%. The mechanism of this molecule is unique in the sense that it inhibits both DNA gyrase and topoisomerase 4 with preferential action on DNA gyrase. We know that many antibiotic resistance happens because of the topo4 mutation. And even if the MDR pathogen has developed topo4 mutation, this molecule will work because of its preferential action on DNA gyrase. The second mechanism of resistance with many antibiotics is the efflux pump, where the, the antibiotics will be thrown out of the pathogen. But this molecule is not a substrate for no reflux pump. Therefore, the concentration remains adequate within the bacterial cell for its bacteriocidal action. Apart from that, it's as a superior serial action against the biofilms as well. So all these actions put together will give the agent a potent activity against MDR gram-positive pathogens, including MRSA. We have extensively studied this molecule with various bacterial isolates which we have collected. There were two programs, Sendry program and an Aspire program. Sendry program is a global surveillance program where we have collected more than 12,000 bacterial isolates from 154 medical institutions across four continents. And in ASPE program is a national program in India where we have collected 1376 clinical isolates from 16 centers across 12 states. And what we have found that this molecule is having a multi-spectrum covering, coverage covering gram-positive pathogen, including MRSA, VRSA, VISA, as well as linozole in non susceptible strains. It also covers streptococcus pneumoniae, both macrolide and penicillin resistant, and also the endococcus fecalis in gram-positive space. In gram-negative space, it covers respiratory gram-negative, H. influenza, morassilla, and other quinolone sensitive gram-negative pathogens. Additionally, it has a coverage against atypicals, mycoplasma, chlamydia, legionella, and also has a coverage against anaerobes, clostridium, peptostreptococcus, as well as bacterioids. So it covers well the MDR gram-positive pathogen, has some activity against an, a gram-negative, and a good activity against anaerobes and atypical pathogens. So these are recent data which is published in Journal of Antimicrobial Agents and Chemotherapy. We, uh, this data is from CMC Vellur, which is a reputed tertiary care hospital in India, where they have tested 793 Staphylococcus aureus, which include 441 MRSA strain. It also includes HVSA strain and also the most virulent community acquired PBL positive Bengal Bakun. And what they have found that this molecule is 100% sensitive to all these pathogens with an MIC range of 0.5, while other anti MRSA agents, the MICs are relatively higher, nearing the breakpoint. We also have studied uh, the, uh, the activity against anaerobes. This study is done in US, where they have collected the isolates from various size, various infections, in the abdominal infection, skin and skin specific infection, diabetic foot infection, respiratory tract infection, and where they have tested almost all anaerobic pathogens and have a good coverage against anaerobic pathogens with, uh, with an MIC range from 0.5 to 2, which is better than metronidazole and clindamycin. So we know that many, all the anti-MRC agents which we have, either vancomycin, ticoplanin, or linozolid, Gram positive coverage and doesn't cover anaerobes or gram negative or atypical. And when you are suspecting a gram positive plus anaerobe, as in a diabetic foot infection, this can be considered as a monotherapy. One of the important properties of this molecule is the biofilm permeation and eradication. As we know, it's a major challenge in diabetic foot infection. And this is an actual study which we have done to compare the potency of this molecule against the biofilm embedded pathogen. And this is a scanning electron microscopy images. This is an untreated biofilm. The daptomycin uh, treated biofilm shows that daptomycin doesn't have any activity. Clindamycin also doesn't have any activity. Linozolid has some activity, but when we look at MROC, it shows a complete and drastic eradication of MRSA biofilm. So this property will be helpful for you to treat your infections, which are challenging, which are challenging by the formation of biofilm. And I understand it that in, in, in diabetic foot infections, the 70, more than 70% of the pathogens are biofilm for this. Another important property is the high bacterial killing property of this molecule, which has shown, and we have given a hundred times challenge. And even with a high bacterial load, this molecule has shown a rapid bactericidal killing property within two to three hours, uh, uh, three to four hours, it has shown a two to three log kill and is sustained over a period of time. But when you look at the other anti MRSA agent, it shows a subdued response, which does, cannot withstand the high bacterial load and cannot show its killing property. So in diabetic foot infection, if you are suspecting a high bacterial load, Many other antibiotics may not work in that setting, and this molecule, even in high bacterial load, it will work. We know that macro, uh, the pathogens like uh, uh, MRSA or Staphylococcus will reside within the uh, macrophages, and we have assessed the intracellular killing property of this molecule. The molecule penetrates well into the macrophages, and it 
shows the killing property, it shows his bacterial potency and is much better than the other anti MRSA agents. And we know that in, in, in the site, uh, site of infection, like diabetic food infection, where fast abscess, the acidic, it's an acidic environment where the pH is relatively less. And one of the unique property of this molecule is that because of its side chain, COOH, it, and it get enhanced its activity in acidic environment. So for example, in this particular MRSA strain, the MIT for uh, at a controlled pH is 0.5, but when the pH is relatively less at 5.5, the MIC even decreases, that means the potency increases. So this property will be helpful for you to treat your infections where you feel that at the site of infection like diabetic foot infection where the pH is relatively less. And even in the biofilm environment, the pH is relatively less. Therefore, many antibiotics, even if they benefit, they may not show its bacteriocidal activity, but this molecule because of its unique structure shows a bacteriocidal activity even in an acidic pH in first aspect. So we have done 18 clinical studies with this molecule out of which six are done in US, 1381 subjects are enrolled and we have more than 50 publications in various reputed journals and have a lot of publication in poster presentation in various international conferences. This is the summary of phase one study which we have done for MROC IV, IV formulation where seven studies are done out of which six are done in India and one in US. This is the study a summary of phase one study which we have done in, uh, for MROC O which shows that seven studies are done out of which five are done in US. The important studies which you have done in US are the food effect and absolute bioavailability, the thorough QT study, the intrapulmonary pharmacokinetics and hepatic safety and hepatic impairment study I'll discuss in the coming slides. Coming to the pharmacokinetics of this molecule, as we discussed, the oral drug will get absorbed very, very, very fast from the uh, intestinal epithelium and within the intestinal epithelium itself, it will be converted into the active formulation. Therefore, the bioavailability is more than 90%. And the phase one study, which we have done in US has shown that food does not alter the bioavailabilities. Therefore, it can be taken with or without food. Metabolism is through liver, but it is not going through the cytochrome P450 metabolic pathway. Basically, it's going through the phase two pathway conjugation pathway with liver and reflosis sulfate as a predominant metabolite. Since it's not going through the CYP enzyme pathway, those concomitant medications, the anti-diabetic medications that give, we give to the patient, to the patient like sulfonylurea or DPP4, which are either inducers or inhibitors of CYP enzyme, will not have any drug drug interaction with this molecule. It distributes well into the tissues and unrolled plasma concentration is fairly good. Excretion is through both urine and uh, feces. But importantly, the unchanged drug which is passing through urine is very minimal, less than 3%. Therefore, the pharmacokinetics are not expected to be altered in renally impaired patients. We have IV as well as oral. When we look at the pharmacokinetics of IV and oral, it's matching and superimposing. The CMAS, T half, and AUZ for both these formulations are similar. And we know that because of this property being a rapid bactericidal activity and, uh, and a matching pharmacokinetics, this will be a suitable agent for switchover from IV to oral formulation. This is a phase one study which we have done in US, which shows the lung penetration of this molecule. It penetrates well into the lung tissues, which is one of the major tissues which is difficult to penetrate. It has shown the ELF concentration is more than seven times and alveolar macrophages concentration is more than two times that of the uncon plasma concentration. And this is the phase one study which we have done in US, the cardiac safety study, the thorough QT study. And it, here we have given a supratherapeutic dose of 2,600 milligram stat. And even at a supratherapeutic dose, this molecule didn't show any QT interval prolongation and can be safely given to your patients who have cardiac comorbidity or patients who are at risk of QT interval prolongation. This is the phase one study which we have done in US, the hepatic safety study and hepatic impairment study, which shows that the drug doesn't have any hepatotoxicity and there is no dose adjustment required even in severe hepatic impaired patients. The phase three study which we have done in India is with 501 subjects in skin and skin structure infection, diabetic foot infection, and patients with concurrent bacteremia. And the complicated skin infections included cellulitis, erythipilas, burn infections, wound infections, and major cutaneous infections, abscess, and deep wound abscess. And it has shown good clinical response uh, in uh, all the patients with a 91% clinical cure with MROC. And in diabetic foot infections uh, subgroup, it has shown a better response, 91.6% with MROC, where, or when compared to 76.9% with linozole. Overall, the molecule is well tolerated. There is no severe side effects being reported from phase one to phase three. In phase three study, the, uh, the side effects, which is reported in more than 1% of the patient with MROC is uh, constipation. That is 3.6% had constipation. 
the linozolin group also has 1.6 percent had constipation and there are no other side effects being reported or with major side effects being reported or with the molecule and these patients with constipation they were patients hospitalized patients with severe infection and we do we know that uh, the hospitalized patients tend to have uh, constipation the currently available RDMRC agents that we have, the older agents, vancomycin, ticoplanin, the glycopeptide, we know that they are slow bactericidal agents. They have limitations of nephrotoxicity, ototoxicity, red man syndrome, and the MIC creep for these molecules are increasing. So in order to overcome that, we increase the dose. And again, when we increase the dose, then nephrotoxicity come into the play. The other agent which we have is linozolid. We know that it's a bacteriostatic agent. And at the same time, comes up with merosuppression, thrombocytopenia, and lactic acidosis. And it's not an approved agent for MRSA bacteremia as well. Because of this limitation, it's not given for a prolonged period. Daptomycin is not effective for a pneumonia patient, and it comes up with skeletal muscle toxicities. Therefore, the creatine kinase need to be monitored very frequently. PG cyclin, even though it has activity, is not routinely used as an anti MRSA agent. So overall, the molecule is uh, well tolerated in clinical studies with good safety profile in comparison to existing or in-development agents. Good GI tolerance, no hepatotoxicity, no QT interval prolongation, no nephrotoxicity, no phototoxicity, and there is no dose adjustment required in elderly patients and patients with hepatic impairment. The dosage is 800 milligrams twice daily for MROC IV. It need to be given as an infusion over 90 minutes. MROC O, it is 1000 milligrams twice daily. It can be taken with or without food. Contraindications, we don't have studies in children less than 18 years and pregnancy and lactation, so it's contraindicated over there. And patients with hypersensitivity to other quinolone and Indicated and patients with history of tendon disorder is contraindicated. As we discussed, there is minimal drug drug interaction with this molecule. And in special population, hepatic impairment, there is no dose adjustment required. Renal impairment, as the drug excretion through urine active formulation is very less, pharmacokinetics are not expected to be altered. Geriatric patients with on corticosteroid quotient should be used while prescribing the drug. We also have developed the susceptibility disc for this molecule which will be uh, uh, helpful to take an informed decision regarding the usage of this molecule. So to summarize, we have a unique molecules with a unique chemical structure. Owing to the unique chemical structure, it has a unique mechanism of action inhibiting both DNA guides and topo four with preferential action on DNA guides. It's a rapid bactericidal activity. Owing to superior safety can be given for long-term use. There is no dose adjustment required in hepatic and environment. Easier to switch over from IV to oral formulation. It penetrates well into the tissues. It eradicates uh, the biofilm and have an anti-biofilm property. And it has a unique broad spectrum coverage covering gram-positive pathogen, including MRSA, respiratory gram-negative, atypical, and anaerobic pathogen. So that's my from my end, uh, uh, the unique properties of this molecule. And uh, I would request uh, Dr. Suri to take over the session. Thank you, uh, Dr. Jashit, for a very nice presentation and illustrating the uh, new molecule which is available in the country. And uh, uh, very wisely said, it's uh, you have shown us the hepatic and renal safety of this molecule, uh, intravenous and oral uh, formulation of this molecule. And uh, very important is that it eradicates biofilm. So some studies I hope you have done, which shows that it eradicates the biofilm which is very important for this chronic wounds, whether we are dealing in chronic wounds with the venous ulcers, bed sores, pressure ulcers, or diaptic foot ulcers, and also coverage of gram-positive MRSA and uh, uh, gram-negative uh, infection covering with enrobes is important. So I think uh, that's it. And we have some questions uh, to ask, um, uh, which uh, we have for the panelists. But before that, I will uh, invite uh, Mr. TJ Baring uh, who is the CEO of uh, in USA and uh, advisor to Western University of Podiatric Sciences and to IPA. And uh, Baring, if you can share your experience that what are the uh, future prospects of spreading education in India and how we are going to tie up with the Western University uh, College of Podiatric Sciences and what are the future uh, plans here to uh, spread the course. As we have said, we are uh, in the process of developing this fellowship, a mind fellowship of Indian Podiatry Association, where any doctor sitting in any part of the country and South Asia can do a fellowship in diabetic footwear. So, Mr. Baring. Thank you, Dr. Suri. So, essentially, uh, what we're looking at is uh, getting this fellowship uh, started uh, with uh, both Western University and Indian Podiatry Association. Uh, and uh, we are looking at uh, uh, 
tentative start date of September 1st for now. And uh, we pretty much uh, are keen that uh, we should be able to spread the knowledge. And as you're aware, uh, you know, US obviously the podiatry had taken lead and uh, there are uh, college, there are dedicated degrees, uh, uh, DPM degrees, doctorate in podiatry medicine. So uh, what I felt was that there was uh, this uh, good need for us to partner together uh, along with Indian Podiatry Association, who's on forefront of uh, fighting uh, the diabetic foot issues and uh, which as we all are aware is uh, one of the leading problems. And I think uh, the mission of uh, all of us combined is one simple thing and that is I prevent amputations. That means uh, how many, and most of these amputations anyway are reversible if uh, either detected on time or if managed correctly. So I think it's very exciting to get this uh, process started. Uh, it's very exciting to see it growing and uh, definitely uh, I'm keen to push uh, as much as possible. And uh, uh, this, uh, for any questions about this diabetic foot uh, management, uh, one can reach uh, Office of Indian Podiatry Association and they can forward that to me uh, if required. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Baring, for a very nice uh, ideas you have shared. Now I'll invite uh, uh, Dr. Ravi Kamipli from Georgia, Atlanta, USA. Uh, for his uh, uh, nice comments on diabetic foot infection. We know he's a wound care specialist. Before that, I want to share a, a, a slide with you. We have a lot of people who are joined with us. Uh, we have uh, three doctors from Bangladesh, one from Toronto, Canada, uh, 40 people from Myanmar. Uh, so that shows that so many people are interested in diabetic foot infections and Charcot's foot. In Nepal, we have three doctors. Philippines, we have 12 doctors. And from USA, we have four doctors who have registered for this. And from India, we have many people who have joined for this. So it's it's a international uh, uh, dilemma that, diaptic, as I said, diaptic foot infections are present in every part of the world. And so many people have registered. So thanks to Vocard and their team for organizing this and uh, spreading this word of uh, diaptic foot infection. And as Baring has said, that the main goal of all, all of us as a clinician or as pharmaceutical is that I prevent amputation. That is a slogan which runs for IPA. And uh, just after Dr. Ravi Kambiupuli, Rajneesh will take over and with a vote of thanks, and he will tell us about the activities of IPA and I prevent amputation. Uh, Ravi, uh, Ravi Kambiupuli, unmute yourself. Yeah, hi. That's not me, though. I, That's not I, me. I, 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 <laughs> So, so, so basically, what uh, I want to make two two points. Uh, uh, the most important point I want to bring to the front. Yes, I'm an infectious disease doctor and a wound care doctor, but found out that it is the nutrition that is really the problem that has to be taken care of. The, the, the major thing, the major thing that has to be addressed. If you see what we are. Uh, with uh, Dr. Lavovich's amazing presentation, uh, you know, we are, we are on the side of managing the problem, but also prevention is the thing. And there are three, three tissues in the blood that don't need insulin receptors, that don't have insulin receptors. And those things are retina, kidneys, and nerves and whenever there is this glucose spike these tissues are the one that get affected and when these tissues that get affected then um, th that's where the real problem happens so idea of what i'm trying to promote uh, as a part of this whole delivery of solution is a preventive strategy is to make sure that it is all about the thing that you are seeing in the slide here and on my background, we talk about environment lifestyle that influence how the immunology changes and how our lipidology changes and how that influences the microbes and microbiome that then make a difference in the genetics, which is through the process of what is called as epigenetic factors, which is what I'm trying to call a disease triangles concept. So. I mean, like through 
Indian Podiatric Association and the team we have, I think we have an amazing thing going on. And with Western University, we are, we are planning many things. And I'm hoping as a part of the thing, uh, Western University is on the west side of US and on the eastern side, hopefully one of these days we'll start something in Augusta, Georgia, where I am. And then also we'll do a series of uh, things, hopefully with Indian IPA, wherein we should possibly call it International Podiatry Association now, Amar, and then and try to take it up and empower. If, if you look at it, nutrition is the core of it. Even with people who have COVID and problems with COVID, um, the outcomes depend upon the nutrition, how their lipid changes, how their immune system changes. I can go off on this talk for an hour, but uh, since the discussion today is totally different, um, I'll just stop there. Thank you very much. Mute, you're, you're on mute, Amar. Uh, thank you, Ravi, for your nice comments on that. And uh, I have multiple of questions uh, here in the chat box, but I think, uh, Dr. Jonathan, we can take one or two questions for you. Uh, the first one is, when to uh, refer a patient for Charcot's uh, reconstructive surgery by Dr. Rashul from Dhaka. If you can take that question, when to refer the patient for Charcot's uh, uh, reconstructive surgery? And there's similar question, when will you advise surgical intervention in Charcot's foot? So both questions are together, so you can take them together. Yes. Sure. Yeah. So uh, that's a tough question. Um, because again, with Charcot, the, the management is uh, not clear and there are they're generally unhealthy patients, um, many with, with severe renal disease, uh, uncontrolled diabetes, and so on, uh, many comorbidities. So, uh, you know, we try and reserve surgery until the end, if possible. Um, I've had, in 20 years, only two patients on me um, have coded during surgery, uh, one of which I lost, both were Charcot patients. So uh, you can see this, the, the gravity of the issue when you take them to surgery. Potentially, you're facing many other issues and comorbidities you're managing at the same time. Um, so uh, when would I refer them is when they fail any conservative uh, treatment with, with offloading and then keeping them stable without any chronic, without any uh, acute exacerbations uh, so they can say stable. Usually that's with a shoe and an AF, a good AFO, um, at least mid calf, uh, if it's involving the ankle or hind foot. Um, the other reasons really, so the unstable uh, foot that can that can have uh, acute on chronic problems, uh, or you keep getting recurrent acute charco, uh, then we know that uh, you have to do more than what we have. Uh, Midfoot charco can do very well with surgery, a uh, hind foot and ankle. Uh, the results are not as good, but they can still be effective if we do, if we realign the foot and the structure, um, the architecture. Uh, but we, we have to make sure we do that and we fuse it and we are uh, what looks to be aggressive with all of the internal or external fixation, but actually it's preventing other problems, collapse, or even the surgery causing an acute problem, uh, you know, an acute charco, which can exacerbate it as well. Uh, we don't want to operate during the acute phase, so we have to calm that down first. The acute phase is much more harder to uh, get the fixation to hold because um, of the inflammatory process and the recurrent breakdown that's still ongoing. Um, although people are now doing it uh, acutely, the results are mixed. Um, there's a lot of bias in it because there's so few people doing it. They're trying to only show their good results most likely. Um, so I, I still question that and would not do that myself. Thank you. Th thank you so much. And there's another question, sir. Uh, I think you have already answered that. Uh, there was a question that when we have foot infection, the temperature rises uh, because of the inflammation. So how to differentiate? Uh, just you can say a comment on that for the audience. Sure. Sure. Yeah. And, and a lot of that goes to clinical suspicion, like I showed in one table where I showed you how many times clinical suspicion is part of this, uh, really based on the history. Um, if there's a, a foot infection and we know that, then obviously we have to treat that first no matter what we're doing. We have to get rid of the infection. 
um, before you put on total contact cast or something that's gonna obscure the wounds or obscure the infections, we can't treat that locally. So uh, if we know there's an infection, then we manage that and we, we still offload them, but not as effectively, most likely. Um, if we're not sure, then we start running the blood test. That's when you do the bone biopsies, potentially when you do MRI or even PET scan uh, and all your other diagnostic tests. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Levovitz, uh, for the nice presentation and nice uh, answering to the questions. Uh, I just want to uh, have a comment from Rajneesh Saxena on eye prevent amputation, and then over to Dr. Jashid and Nitin for a vote of thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Amar. And uh, I am also very much thankful to Dr. Jonathan for giving very nice uh, uh, research activity, research uh, work, and uh, re your uh, lecture reg regarding the prevention of Charcot arteriosis. As you, we all know, th there is one in every 10 people at the time of diagnosis of diabetes are at risk having any one of the risk factor. We, uh, with this risk factor, you can develop diabetic food problem in future life. Similarly, out of all the diabetic population in our country, about one quarter having any risk factor and any sort of diabetic food problem in their future life. So it is very important to prevent these diabetic food problems. And from the day of diagnosis of diabetes, we have to go for screening of fit of the patient. We have to screen all the all the fit, all the foot of the patient of all the diabetic patient. So after regular screening of the foot we can prevent development of diabetic foot problem. So for eye prevent amputation campaign, regular screening of foot is very important. So I advise all the delegates, all the doctors, all the diabetologists to go for regular screening of the foot for preventing amputation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Rajneesh. Uh, I think the main, main uh, uh, force behind Indian Podiatry Association and all the activities which are done are uh, originated from the mind of Dr. Rajneesh Saxena and he's the main pillar of Indian Podiatry Association along with Dr. Sanjay Kale and Dr. Ravi Kamipri. I'm all thankful to my core team for this and I'm thankful to Vokart for taking this initiative, Nathan, Dr. Jashir and all the other team members. Uh, for uh, spreading this uh, knowledge. I think the main take home is that we need to educate clinicians and physicians and diabetologists, as well as people who are working in diabetic food care. That's very important with new technologies, new treatment modalities. And I'm thankful to Dr. Uh, Labovitz for sharing his ideas on a very important topic of Charcot's code, which is often misdiagnosed and we need to take care to the main aim of all this to join together is to eye prevent amputation for this. And we really need to uh, do this thing and uh, taking take home messages for diabetic foot infections, which I shared during my presentation and Dr. Jashish's presentation, how we can use new molecules yeah. because there's so much of resistance which is developing. Because a lot of uh, antibiotics are used at the primary level, at the primary levels. And people, by the time they come to the tertiary center, they are all resistant to most of the bugs. So we need to uh, keep these uh, uh, superior antibiotics in our kitty so that we can kill the bug at a very fast pace. Thank you so much and over to Nitin. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Suri. It was a wonderful deliberation and the, both the talks were excellent. And before we go to the vote of thanks, I would like to uh, introduce two of my colleagues who uh, in fact were the backbone for this event. One is Mr. Vishwagoro, another is Ms. Anaita. Can you please put on the camera? These yes. people have totally worked day in and day out for making this possible. And in fact, they were the uh, people behind the designing of the invite and other things. Along with that, all the invites which have gone to doctors, more than 8,000 doctors with each, have been the effort of Mr. Vishwagoro. And now I'd request uh, Mr. Nitin Badana. He's a national sales manager for the MROC team to kindly uh, open the camera and give a, the word of thanks. No, uh, yeah, thanks, thanks, Nitin. It's my privilege, you know, uh, to have been asked to propose a vote of thanks uh, on this occasion. And on behalf of OCAD, I would uh, thank uh, Dr. Jonathan Labovich, Dr. Uh, A.P. Suri, sir, Dr. Ajni Saxena, sir, uh, Mr. T.J. Baring, uh, Dr. Ravi uh, Kampal, 
and uh, and uh, you know for sharing such a insightful uh, uh, finding on the on the topic that we uh, discussed today so once again uh, thanks to everybody for joining this uh, this uh, such a nice event uh, international event uh, thanks to all participants uh, thanks nitin for making this a wonderful event a successful event uh, thanks anaita uh, divya uh, uh, dr asta joshi dr ritika rampal and uh, mr vishwa gorav so thanks everybody that, that's from my side yeah good night Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Good night. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Doctor Labovitz, and Samarin. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Yeah. Thank you. Everybody, be well. Yeah. We'll keep in touch. We'll keep in touch. Doctor. Absolutely. Uh, looking, looking forward to see you in India soon after COVID, whenever it is. So. <laughs> so I hope that soon, because I'm tired yeah. of COVID. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank we'll get rid of that. <laughs> and and thank, thanks, Mister Baring. And there thank are two little. There are two little. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. If thank you, there bye. are two, two Nitins, then is your product will grow uh, by uh, twice, two times, four times, yes, again. Yes, right. Again. <laughs> one is one is Khanna, one is Badana, sir. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> endorse it. You have to endorse it in your prescriptions. Yes. <laughs> thanks, sir. Thanks. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Okay, 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 thank you. Okay, Jonathan. Good night. Bye. Bye. Bye.